Hello, it's Scott Manley here with part I've Forgotten of Kerbal Space Ships, our serious business. No, I'm just kidding. It is episode 20, and I'm sure I won't make that mistake again because I keep making that mistake. So, if you remember at the last end of last episode, we were putting a small spacecraft into orbit, which was called Docking Target. Maybe you don't see the name of it, but I assure you it is called Docking Target because... I want to use it as a target for docking. We have a contract, or we have now, we will have a contract to dock things. Uh, <laughs> now this thing of course is rather lightweight and was pushed into orbit spectacularly quickly. So quickly it means we can sit back and watch the demise of the booster stage as it falls back to planet Earth here. Yes, yeah, we get to see the fairing catch fire. We get to see things explode, things fall apart, and eventually things will in fact fall into the water. And if you're wondering what that strange jingling sound is, that's the kiddens who will not leave me alone at this time. Anyway, that docking target will soon have company in space, in the same way that a kitten will stick to me when it has a bell around its neck and I'm trying to record things quietly. That satellite, that target, will hopefully attract to it another satellite with a docking port and they will indeed bond together in space. I'm just waiting for the right time for these things to come around and then I will launch, hopefully putting them relatively close together. So you see where my launch site is? I'm waiting for the spacecraft to come around the far side of the Earth here. That's not it. Uh, that's not it. Where will it show itself? Oh, is that it? No, that's not it. And I think this is it, just coming around the edge of the planet. Is this it? Docking target. Okay, so now we have to totally guesstimate how long this thing is going to take to get into space. And honestly, this is a very fast launch, so I have no clue. So I just guess my way through it, and off I go. So now that we're not rushing this on at the end of an episode, you can get a better look at this vehicle. We have standard solid rocket boosters to get it off the pad and through the sound barrier. And then for the main sustainer engines, those are the RD-107s that, of course, originally propelled the R-7 rocket that eventually evolved into the Soyuz launcher. Their main fuel is, of course, liquid oxygen and kerosene, with the turbo pumps uh, working or powered by high test peroxide. Anyway, up above 70 kilometers, I think that's a suitable altitude for me to ditch this fairing. And we get a better look at the vehicle underneath. We're going to have a second stage which also uses the uh, liquid kerosene and liquid oxygen. Super high efficiency engine here. We just actually try to keep ourselves low because we're going for the target or orbit. The eagle-eyed among you will note that I actually ditched that second stage before it was out of fuel because I simply wanted it to fall back to Earth. We are having far too much space debris up and around here and finding the targets in the mess that is the orbits near the Earth is getting to be a serious problem. Good news is the cats seem to have gone away. Perhaps they're afraid that I will perform some sort of NASA experiment, like was actually carried out where they took cats on board the Vomit Comet and wanted to see uh, what they do when they try to write themselves in zero-g. They all get very, very confused. So yeah, we're gonna get ourselves into a, an encounter here, and first thing we need to do is correct the inclination. We are about four degrees, uh, almost five degrees difference in our inclination here. That is not as good as I should have liked. I really should have waited until the orbits were closer aligned before performing this. This means we need several hundred meters per second of delta V. Even a few degrees of separation means hundred deg you know, hundreds of meters per second when your orbits are so f rapid. A lot of people seem to forget just how much velocity difference a small inclination difference in inclination actually means. You know, when Columbia was in space on the fateful mission that destroyed it, people asked why couldn't have gone to the ISS, and of course, because it would have needed a plane change maneuver which was way beyond the orbital maneuvering system. And uh, yeah, the movie Gravity, a lot of people criticize that because they see the debris flying past and they say that doesn't look like seven kilometers per second. Well, guess what? Even if it's moving, even if it's on a 10 degree inclined orbit, it'll be flying past at about a kilometer per second, and that is plenty deadly. They never really 
tell us exactly what kind of orbit the other stuff is on. So the velocity itself isn't any inclination that the movie was necessarily wrong. Besides, it's a movie. It's just supposed to look gorgeous. Anyway, as it turns out, I underestimated how long that uh, burn to change the inclination would take. So I needed to wait a little bit longer and then make a second correction burn because I just had so much difference to catch up on. So we're not combining maneuvers here just simply because I was lazy. This thing I put together with tons of Delta V, way more than say the shuttle would be working from. The shuttle had a few thousand, had maybe a thousand feet per second, not even a few thousand. It had several hundred meters per second of Delta V, but uh, you have to be very careful when you have only such small margins. And thankfully, when you're doing this for reals, you actually have people working with computers and stuff, rather than say me, eyeballing a lot of this using instrumentation that is, um, well, still very much human-driven. Anyway, the second burn that we're going to do is going to put us into a much higher orbit, a much higher elliptical orbit, and the idea is that we'll burn up, we'll go very high over the top and let the other spacecraft catch up on us. And then once we come back to it, we will then slow down and put ourselves in the orbit. So this is incredibly inefficient, but since I have so much Delta V available, I can abuse this as much as I like, and that will save me a great deal of time. You'll also see that I'm using the linear RCS here just to fine-tune that approach. And right at the end there, yeah, just over 200 meters is going to be that final approach. I will be flying past at almost 100 meters per second, but in a single orbit, I'm going to fly over the top and come back and end up right next to my target, albeit moving pretty quickly, but that's fine. Plenty of Delta V to do this. Now, obviously, you would never, ever do this in a real spacecraft. This is because I'm playing a game, I have excess Delta V, and uh, my real time is far more valuable than the clock time in the simulation. Of course, in real space missions, it's all about the mass, which means it's all about the fuel loads, which means it's all about minimizing your delta V. So we're coming in here, and I'm using my usual trick of pushing the retrograde marker towards the target here. We've got our approach distance now down to about 50 meters, although that is slowly changing as I'm making small adjustments here. We want to come right in close as we can, as slow as we can, and then we shall get this docking on. I mean, orbiting a real-sized Earth and then performing these docking maneuvers is pretty much the same as you would do it in or when you're orbiting Kerbin. The real thing that makes docking and everything hard in real life is that, you know, the, the margins for error are much smaller, but you also have many, many more smarter people working on the problem. So we're coming in close for the docking. We've targeted that docking port. I do not have any navigation tools or anything to help me here. So I end up just doing my good old fashioned eyeball. I put myself in locked camera mode. And what I want to do is put my spacecraft in such an orientation that I'm lined up with the target as well, right? So we just turn it around and make sure everything's looking good. And then once I've got them lined up over the top, I can approach in ever so slowly, ever so carefully. We're six meters out. We're moving in at about four inches per second or 10 centimeters per second. We're moving in slightly faster than your average docking. I think the space shuttle had to dock at under two inches per second. I could be wrong on that. Uh, obviously this thing is going to have the magnetic port thing kick in and they will slam together and then the mission will be complete and I shall be happy and we shall have ticker tape parades for the satellite designers. Okay, this is not really the most sexy or awesome mission I've ever done because it's an unmanned spacecraft, but let's face it, it means that I'm not going to kill off anyone this time and that is not unknown in this mission. Here we go. And docked. Sort of. Come on, dock. Yes. No, maybe. Maybe. Yes, we are finally docked. And we get some warnings about insufficient avionics, which is actually to be expected because, of course, I turned off the avionics in one of the target vehicles. 
Uh, that's actually a good question. I need to remember which one is which. <laughs> I'll have to rename these things at some point. But we do not have a complete contract for some reason. And I'm wondering if it's because one of the spacecraft was not launched before the docking contract. The docking contract didn't say that you had to launch both spacecraft after the contract was accepted, did it? I, I don't think it did. It just said that you had to launch a new spacecraft and dock it to another one. You didn't say you had to have both spacecraft launched after the contract. Ah, so that's a bit of a waste. That was a completely pointless mission. Thank you very much. So, well, what do I do? First thing I do is I go and I order a new spacecraft. I mean, it's going to be identical in every way to the spacecraft we've already launched, right? It's called Docking Target. Docking Target 2 with some uh, upgrades to it, but this is it here. Same vehicle, same kerosene liquid oxygen engine. Go to the launch button and we build. No need to simulate or anything, right? And then, of course, we just have to wait three weeks while the engineers actually build it. So yeah, as I was saying, it's not really a particularly sexy application of our space science because it is all unmanned, but it does keep everyone alive. I mean, most of the space station was actually put together one module at a time by crewed missions on the space shuttle. But the Russian components were mostly launched on top of rockets, right? Without, they were unmanned rockets. And I think in the case of Zvezda, which was the third component, it went up and it docked the station completely autonomously. Funny story about that, incidentally, is because of lack of money, they launched that without any backup and any insurance. And if that was to blow up, they would have not had a way to reboost the space station. So uh, NASA apparently developed an interim control module, which was uh, derived from an old spy satellite, apparently. And this would be, it would dock on and it would keep the space station in orbit while Zvezda was being rebuilt or something. In the end, it wasn't needed, obviously, but and they've talked about repurposing it. It is currently mothballed. At one point, I believe it was being seriously considered for as a robotic service mission for the Hubble Space Telescope. When they weren't sure whether they wanted to send another space shuttle to the HST, they uh, project they, they came up with the idea of using this as a robot. Anyway, look, we have our spacecraft. It's ready to go, and we are headed upwards. As quickly as... Why am I not steering? We're not steering. I'm trying very hard to steer and... What? Oh, my engines aren't lit. That's not good. I have no engine... Okay, this mission is doomed. Now... Uh, <laughs> that is not expected. We're not burning any of that kerosene or liquid oxygen. And now... Now we're just flying through the sky like a giant lawn dart. Uh, okay. Well, uh, what can we do here? Why is this happening? That's a very good question. How did I get here? Let's ditch everything. Now, before, the, before we run out of... What we want to do, actually, is we want to fire up this stage here. Very risky. I'm waiting for the... Risky, stable, very stable. Go for it! Yes! Now we're able to start flying. Unfortunately, we're only generating about 0 0.7... 0 0.78 Gs, so we are... basically starting to decelerate very slowly and fall back to the ground. <laughs> oh, oh, actually, no. Thrust-to-weight ratio is 0 0.81, but SLT, I think, is our current atmospheric... Uh, thrust, so, oh uh, man, I'm hoping I can burn off fuel quickly enough, maybe I can just save a bit of this or something, I don't know, this is just funny to see, when space missions go wrong, it's always far more entertaining to watch the debris fall back to the earth and see what, see what it looks like, see if I can land this thing, I do not think I can land this thing, and the reason is, while I am burning up fuel, I would have to burn up fuel for about three minutes before this thing would possibly have a chance of generating 1G of thrust. But on top of that, as I'm sinking down towards the surface, the atmospheric pressure is increasing and the thrust is decreasing because this is a vacuum engine. This thing is going to plummet into the ground. Question is how many pieces will be left? <laughs> and why did the main engine not fire? That's so not fair. 
That, uh, that is just one of these great mysteries. Bits exploding everywhere. Uh, oh, and we're flipping. Bits are falling apart. And we're gonna pummel into the ground. There we go. Insufficient avionics. No way. Insufficient avionics for reals. Smash, 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 explode. Okay. Well, that was a disaster. Why did that happen? <sighs> maybe I fired. Maybe my sequencing was firing in the wrong direction. Maybe I dropped the. Maybe the spacecraft dropped from the clamps, and therefore the liquid engines never fired. That, that, I'm gonna have to figure that out. Okay, I figured out what happened. So, um, I upgraded everything using Secan once again. A very foolish move that I keep on doing, and. Realism Overhaul has upgraded these engines now. So these engines, now if I bring up the, the GUI, <laughs> this is fantastic. So remember how I've said that they use peroxide? Well, now they've added HTP to the fuel requirements, so I need to actually do this now. So I need to include the high-test peroxide for the Soviet engines, otherwise the rocket can't run its turbo pumps. And this thing won't go into orbit. All it had was those little solid rocket boosters. The little solid rocket boosters that could. They could for a little while, just long enough to doom the spacecraft. Clearly when we ordered the spacecraft from the manufacturers, they updated the engines without telling us. They put it together and they forgot to tell us that we needed new uh, rocket fuel in there, otherwise the spacecraft wouldn't actually work at all. Anyway, this time around I spent a whole lot more time making sure that I was launching close to the correct position of the orbit so that we would minimize the inclination changes. This, however, meant that the other spacecraft was practically on the other side of the planet. So, not much I could do about that. I guess I could have waited 45 minutes, but regardless, we went for it. Everything worked. The launch proceeded as expected, and I was no longer foiled by changes to realism overhaul. Except, I'm sure I will find out more things that are going to mess me up in the future. But seriously, spacecraft makes its way into orbit. Now, I did make some minor changes to this. I added extra docking ports because, hey, maybe I could turn this into a little space station or something. If I had just had two nodes, then it wouldn't be that interesting. But three or three nodes, we could actually build something serious out of that. We could just build like a space shanty town, bolting bits and pieces together until it actually works. I think, I think I've used that term space shanty town in the past. Because of the extra mass of the docking ports, we actually run out of fuel on the second stage, which is good. It means we're not wasting anything. Uh, but it is does mean that we rely on this second stage to get us into orbit. And now, you'll notice that the relative inclination is 0.22 degrees, so we're going to have a very small inclination correction. On the other hand, we are just about as far away from the target vessel as possible. So it, what we're going to do is go into a higher orbit for several days until it catches up on us. And when I say several days, that'll probably be how long it takes for me to make another episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.